just um, sending it out real quick for anybody watching out in the future. And it's real awkward because it's quiet. Um, just sending it out real quick. God bless everybody for joining. We're just gonna wait for a few more people to join. Let me know if the music's too loud. Are we good there? Do you guys hear it? I'm trying not to put my bald spot show. If you guys could uh, repost it, send it out, and um, is that better? Um, yeah, so send it out, repost it, um, let some of the girls know that we're going to be teaching tonight. We're continuing uh, Ephesians chapter 5. We left off last week. Um, Bonnie taught last week, so I'm doing this week. Um, and we're actually almost finished with it. I think we got like four more weeks of Ephesians and we're pretty much done. Um, hi, Michelle. How are you? Um, yeah, so we got like four more weeks, I think, and then um, we're done. So if you girls want to send it out, leave your, um, leave your prayer request, we'll pray. What's in the room I've never seen before is this. Oh, I'm in Ethan's room, so if that's why it looks awkward. Just some diapers. Uh, yeah, Michael's computer is in Ethan's room now, so that's why it looks a little weird, right? And let me... If you guys can hear me, let me know. And uh, while we wait, Bonnie, if you can text the girls and let them know that we're live, text them in the uh, 3 p.m. prayer room. 3 p.m. 3 p.m. 3 p.m. prayer. Yeah, just let some of the girls know. We're going to wait a little bit. For future reference, whoever we'll posts this on YouTube, can you guys uh, do me a solid and cut out the awkward <laughs> 15 minutes me just sitting here? That would be nice. So, Chanel, Candy. Yeah, just cut out the first 15 minutes. who's joining god bless i was just sending it out real quick um i wanted to wait for some more people to get on uh in the meantime if anybody has any prayer requests anything they want me to pray for um in a little bit i'm gonna lift up the uh autism list for the children with autism and their parents families um nice nice um Sorry, I was just reading a comment from Michael about Ethan. Um, yeah, so in a minute, I'm going to lift up all the children with autism, um, praying for um, the people who have COVID, uh, anybody who has cancer, the addiction list. Um, so if there's any other prayers, baby Gracie, yes, amen. Um, I'll keep that in prayer as well. So if there's anything else you want to pray for before I start praying, 
And um, just let me know. Yep. Send it out. Candy, do me a favor, like cut out 10 minutes because it's awkward. <laughs> Yeah, we all need more patience, Bonnie. It's a good prayer. We all need it, especially with like the whole COVID thing going on again. So, the Lord gives us patience for being home, stuck in the house some more with the families. It's hard. Um, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray real quick, and then we're gonna start because it's a lot, and I need to get off here around 11:30. So, I'm hoping I can get it done in an hour. There's a lot, so I'm gonna pray real quick. Lord, we come before you um, to your throne of grace, Lord, and first and foremost, we uh, thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your righteousness, your justice, your mercy, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are a just God, and you are not um, a God who who bends to to man, Lord, but you stand on your righteousness lord and all goodness and righteousness and truth flows from you lord i come before you father and i um ask first and foremost for the forgiveness of my sins lord they're laid before me and as we've been doing this study in ephesians lord and reading more about the characteristics of a spirit-filled christian and how we are to live our lives and see that in contrast with our lives lord especially me as reading through your word it's been such a conviction, Lord, on my heart, and it feels heavy sometimes, Lord, but I know that you uh, bore all those sins, Lord, in our place on that cross. You sent your perfect son to die in our place, Lord, but not only did you send Jesus to die in our place, he also lived in our place, and I thank you for that, Father. I'm praying that for the remainder of this night, Holy Spirit, that you would lead me and guide me and speak through me, Lord, um, as I teach your word to other women. Lord, like me, um, who desire to know you more and more and to live a life worthy of the call into which we were called. We pray right now, Lord, for, we stand in agreement all together as sisters, praying for all the children with autism, Lord, we bring the autism list before you. Father, it's such a burden, it's such a heartache for these parents. Um, and now I know they're feeling, Lord, and I'm asking, Father, that you would please give patience to these families give them peace lord give them give them hope let them know that um that our our hope and our joy and our peace doesn't rely on the things of this world and whether we whether we get healing or not for our children or whether we get finances at the right time or whether our bills are paid or um whether we just have it all mentally together lord but our hope and trust rely on you lord and you never fail us I'm praying, Father, that you would completely heal these children of autism, Lord. And we know that you use different means to bring about healing, Lord. It's not always the way we want it sometimes, Lord, but ultimately you bring the best outcome. And we're praying, Father, that you would please, Lord, help these children, Father, who are hyperactive, um, who are self-destructive, Lord, who, who harm themselves, Lord, without knowing, um, who can't communicate, Lord, that you would help them, Father, and help these Gajay, these therapists, these uh, teachers, um, these doctors, what, whatever it is that um, we may be doing for treatment, Lord, we pray that you would help these Gajay, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that you have given them this knowledge um, to know these things, how to help these children um, in their everyday functioning lives, whether it be their fine motor skills, Lord, or even something as small as showing their mother or father um, affection and a hug or a kiss, Lord, or just saying their names. It means so much to us, Lord, when we see these small improvements. And I pray that you continue to help us um, bring people in our lives, Lord, who can encourage us in your word and um, that we may be able to build each other up, Lord, as your word commands us to. Um, we're praying, Father, for all the people with COVID, Lord, we ask that you would protect them, Lord, heal them, heal their families, Father heal their lungs, Lord. We know that you are able to bring about um, a healing for the sickness, Lord, a, a 
an antidote, Lord, a cure for this disease, Father. We're asking, Lord, that you would help uh, protect us, Lord, who don't have it, um, especially all those with immune system problems, Lord, or compromised immune systems, or those who are sick or have heart trouble. We're asking, Father, that you would um, protect us as you've done so far, Lord, throughout this year and a half, almost two years now that this is going on. You've kept us safe. Uh, and we thank you for that, Father. We pray that you would continue to keep us safe and bring home safe all those who um, who are sick or in hospitals or who are quarantined right now. Um, we're also praying for the addiction list, Lord, anybody who um, is addicted to, whether it be alcohol or drugs or um, just any kind of addiction, Lord, whether it be self-harm or just to, even even addicted to gossiping and slandering and can't control our tongues, Lord, we ask, Father, that you would um, calm the minds and the hearts of these people, Lord. We know that um, the gospel is the power unto salvation, Lord, and the gospel is the ultimate healing and the ultimate antidote, um, the ultimate cure, Father, not for worldly diseases um, that harm the body, Lord, but ultimately for the soul. And um, we know that, Lord, whatever whatever happens to us here on earth, Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have a greater hope. Um, we're praying for those who are lost, Lord, who don't know you. We pray that they would come to know you, Lord. We're praying that uh, you would use us, your church, as your vessels, Lord, that we'd be able to speak your gospel boldly um, without compromise, Lord, without fear of uh, offending anybody, but that we would just speak the truth, your, your word and your word only, um, because your word is the only thing able to save uh, to the uttermost, Lord. As you've saved me from my sin and my rebellion, I pray that you would also um, save those others who we are thinking of as we pray right now, Lord. Um, we're also praying for baby Gracie, Lord, that you would give them good news as they're going to this doctor's appointment, as they're trying this trial medication, Lord, that there would be no complications or anything, Father, or any sick children um, who have to go for doctor's appointments. Um, we're praying for Jennifer's son, Lord, um, ask father that you would, um, be there in the, in the operating room, Lord, and, um, let him feel comfort, Lord, give the family comfort, give them peace as they go through this. Let it be a quick surgery, Lord, and let it be successful all to your glory, Lord. We ask these things for all for, according to your will. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Um. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to jump into it really quick. Um, if everybody's ready, I'm going to drink water uh, because I get nervous when I teach and my mouth gets real dry. <laughs> so, um, if you girls want to open your Bibles, I encourage everybody to read along. There's going to be a lot of reading tonight and a lot of me explaining um, anytime we have a study of the Holy Spirit, it's um, a very intimidating thing for me because the Holy Spirit is the most the most blasphemed person of the Trinity um, without us even realizing it. We we call him and it. Um, we we say things that aren't true. Um, about the Holy Spirit and we blaspheme against him without even knowing. It's an unconscious thing. It's just because we have little understanding and this is something that um, we rarely heard about growing up. It was rarely taught because it's it's not something that we could understand and comprehend fully, uh, the Trinity itself. And then um, the Holy Spirit has been neglected by um, churches and teachers to where we don't teach on it. We teach that uh, the Holy Spirit is a feeling, um, that the Holy Spirit comes and goes. Um, we've been taught all those crazy things that aren't true. And um, the only way that we find that they are true is through God's word. So I'm just going to, before we start, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background of what's going on in Ephesus so far. I know we're five chapters in, but I'll try to summarize it as quick as possible. So a little bit of the background of Church of Ephesus, you, I always talk about it, the girls always talk about it every time they share, but um, for people who are on who maybe haven't been listening or don't know, um, anybody who's new on or who's going to watch in the future, um, 
the church of Ephesus was um, planted by Paul um, back in, Act, you can read about it in Acts chapter 18, 19, and 20, I believe. I think it starts in like 18. Um, so that, that city of Ephesus was um, one of those voyaging cities where, or maybe not voyaging, but it was um, kind of like, it was a city where people would come and go a lot because there was a lot of ships coming from there and different merchants and uh, sellers they would they would ship goods out bring goods in they also had one of the seven wonders of the world there um uh, this the statue of artemis this idol or better known as um i think it was it was diana so um long story short there was a lot of gentiles pagans in that area but there was also a small group of jews at the time and but the jews kind of cut themselves off from the pagans and and put themselves in a small little community away from all that Chohamas because people would come from everywhere uh, from the province of Asia to come there once a year and they would all worship this false god. Um, there was a lot of people, yeah, tourists. There was a lot of people who would, um, they would sell uh, idols on the street. That was their main job is to make these, these gods, um, obviously gods who don't exist, but they would just make these uh, idol statues and they would sell them. That was their main source of income. A lot of people who project, practice magic, sorcery, all those kinds of um, pagan things. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later because it, it's important to know for what we're going to be uh, reading. And then the Jews, um, like I said, were just kind of cut off from everybody. But um, when they heard the gospel... Um, this church was planted and it says that um, there were so many books, magic books being burned that it was like over, I think it said 200 or 2000 pieces of silver, um, basically a lot of money. So a lot of people burned their magic books, gave up their, um, maybe not totally their whole ways, but they, they did repent and turn to Christ. And so did uh, some of the Jews. And then they had this little church. Um, so this church was growing rapidly. Um, throughout the year so much that people weren't coming anymore to see uh, that idol statue, one of the seven wonders of the world, but they were coming to visit the church. So that's how um, big this church grew over the past couple of years. Uh, so Paul is writing to them and I believe he's in on um, house arrest in Rome at the time. And um, he's writing to this church. He also wrote um, Colossians, Philippians, I think girls correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm a little rusty on it. I, I haven't taught in a long time. Um, but he wrote like three or four more letters um, during this time. And there was a problem going on in the church where there were um, a lot of the the Gentiles who now converted uh, to Christianity, right? They're believers. They're still holding on to their old superstitions, their old way of life. They're still doing their and they were very scared of evil spirits and uh things like that they were terrified because of the now they understand that the things that they were doing um, before they were saved was very evil um so they were all really worried about that stuff and they still but they still kept some of their old ways um and then the jews were kind of persecuting them uh, the jews who converted to christianity in the sense of like they didn't believe that they were actually children of the promise uh they believed you know that they are because they're bloodline because they're they're Jewish they're Vita. so there was a little bit of quarreling belief, uh, between the church and then Paul writes this letter so we learned that uh, chapters one through three are um, here's what you should believe basically it's um, in a sense a systematic theology it teaches us like everything we need to know um, like the essential doctrines. If you, if you really want to know what doctrine is, read Ephesians 1 through 3. It'll outline it perfect for you. Um, it tells us about our fallen nature. It tells us about who God is and how God is holy and just and righteous. It tells us about Christ and how Christ took upon the sins of the world, how we were once uh, children of darkness and now uh, we are children of light, how we've been adopted, um, how we've been we were predestined before the foundations of the earth. We were chosen by God um, to be blameless before him. So it's really beautiful. Um, and now in the last couple of weeks, we've been through chapters four. We're in chapter five now, but four through six is, okay, here's how you should live according to what you believe. So it's a, the application part of the, of the letter. So he gives them 
I'm sorry. He gives them this um, whole outline of here's what we believe, right? And I'm sure they would agree to all of that. And then he goes from four to six. Okay, now here's how you should live according uh, to how you believe. Because it's, it's not enough for us to just say, hey, I believe this, I believe that. And we're not living it out. That's that's stupid. Like, could you really take take our word for it? Do we really believe what we believe if we're not living it out? Um, that's basically what Paul's telling them. Like, you, you were dead, but now you're made alive. So there's a, a lot of that theme is throughout here. And um, let's see, last week, Bonnie taught on verses 8 through 14. So it's chapter 5, 8 through 14. Uh, and in those verses, Paul tells the church of Ephesus to no longer walk in darkness, but walk now as children of light. And he also talks about how we are to expose the deeds of darkness, not only by correcting it uh, just with the word of God, but also to live out the word of God. Um, that also can correct somebody in their darkness. Um, we learned that at the, at the time, there were people trying to deceive the church. And they were trying to tell them that it's still okay to practice uh, these things they were doing before they were saved. So I guess some other um, false teachers got into the church trying to tell them like, no, it's okay. You could you could still do these uh, these things. And Candy taught about that. There was there was some stuff, crazy stuff going on. But um, I'll I'll explain it later when we get into it. It's a little bit hard for me, but um, I'm gonna have to talk about it. It is the word of God, and it's important to know because these are sins that people still struggle with today. It's not like um, the world was one way 2,000 years ago and it's different now. It's the same sin. It's the same sin. Uh, Romans 1 tells us that um, they invent new ways of sinning. So it's it's the same sin in a different package. It's just branded differently. Uh, like when you go to the store and uh, you've got the, like the, the regular brand Twinkies and then you've got like the great value Walmart brand. It's the same thing. It's just packaged different. But <laughs> So... Um, that's what uh, Bonnie taught a little bit about um, that we read about. Sorry, I'm just going over my notes. So yeah, they were teaching that it's still okay to practice these things, um, the same things that they were doing before they were saved. And Paul tells us that we are to take no part in these evil works and not even to speak of such things. Um, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. So you talk about application. Yeah, so. That, that's basically, in a nutshell, um, go back and watch, <laughs> love my great belly, go back and watch uh, Bonnie's teaching because it was beautiful. She did a beautiful teaching last week. Um, I would sum it up here, but it, she, it was a lot. It was a lot and it was very beautiful. And I really think you guys need to go back and watch that. Um, so let's go to our text for tonight. If you girls open your Bible, verse 15 through 21. Verses 15 through 21 in chapter 5 of uh, Ephesians. It says, um, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, and giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. So I know it's a lot of reading. We're going to take it verse by verse. Um, so the text we are examining tonight speaks of spirit-filled living for the believer, what it looks like what it doesn't look like, and what the result is of living a spirit-filled life. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at each verse and breaking it down to understand the intended meaning. We do this by using scripture to interpret scripture. So the Bible is inerrant, meaning there is no error, no contradiction, no missing information. It is perfect. The Lord preserved his word through such an amazing way um, that even though it was written thousands of years ago, we have the full completed word of God. And the Bible proves itself to be true and is the ultimate standard of which we are to live our lives. It is important to point out that the world always has and still today base their judgments on opinion. Um, as the, and then in contrast to that, we believers base 
our judgments on God's written word. Um, so basically what that's saying is like um, atheist or any pagan or any other religion for that matter. Um, they call what is good according to their opinions, not according to what the Bible says. You see that a lot today. Um, we're, even in Christian churches, so-called Christian churches, they label themselves Christian, something called progressive Christianity. And it's so evil because they twist twist God's word and they tell them, oh, it's not true and that part don't apply to us and it doesn't matter what Paul or Peter uh, said. It only matters what Jesus said, but then they'll take Jesus's words and twist those too. Um, it's it's gross, but that is um, the reason I'm I'm saying this is because like tonight we're talking about um, like it, it brings up drinking, and throughout chapters four and five so far, it's been very hard to talk about because um, not only do we struggle with some of these sins still, um, but like we know some baby Christians we know some people who are not Christian um, who do deal with these kinds of sins and they have these sins in our lives and um, it says that the, the flesh is hostile towards God the, uh, the Bible tells us that the flesh doesn't want to hear the truth we get angry at the truth we don't want to know uh, what God says we disagree with it because it doesn't fit our narrative it doesn't fit what we want to hear it doesn't tickle our ears this is why so many people Listen to these false teachers like um, Joel Osteen or Bill Johnson or Stephen Furtick. They love these guys because these guys tell them everything they want to hear. Um, but it's ultimately God's word that is uh, the ultimate standard of truth. Because um, there, there is no, there cannot be a lie. God cannot lie. It's physically impossible for God to lie. If God lied, he wouldn't be God. He'd be breaking his own rules. So there, there is no lie in God. Christ lived a perfect life uh, because he was God in the flesh, a second person of the Trinity. Um, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit doesn't lie. The Holy Spirit doesn't play games. Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't bend to you, your narrative the same way God doesn't bend to your narrative because they are one in nature, even though three persons, it's one in nature, still one God. We don't worship three different gods. Um, so we know that the Bible is the ultimate truth. I, I don't want anybody to think these are my personal opinions. I'm just reading what the word of God says um, according to scripture. I, I don't want to add my own. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to add my own. Uh, opinions on this because that's uh, that's not right for me to just draw my opinions because I'm still in the flesh the same way everyone else is and um I have no right to call somebody else's sin sin the, the the word of God does so we're just going by what God says um Jesus prays for us in John chapter 17 and he says sanctify them in the truth your word is truth and that's Jesus praying for us so the word sanctification, um, where Jesus prays, sanctify them. Sanctification is a progressive work of the Holy Spirit, which is what we are being taught in this passage. And the reason I mentioned this is because people can be very sensitive to these teachings as it points out our sin. Um, and then I'm, my notes just go over what I just said. So, okay. So let's see what God has to say on these subjects. So let's go back to verse one and verse two. So I put them together because they go together so uh 15 and 16 says look carefully then as you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of time because the days are evil so verse one opens up with a warning telling us to be careful of our walk to watch our conduct uh, we have this new life and the standard we are held to um, in second corinthians we're called ambassadors for christ and this simply means that we are representatives of Christ. We represent him in how we live is important. Um, how we live as believers is important for not only ourselves, but also important to the unbeliever. Um, so Titus 2 verses 7 to 8 says, Show yourself in all respect to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, 
dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. So the, the, the part A of this verse, look carefully then how you walk. So he starts right after um, what Ronnie ended at, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we are made alive um, through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called regeneration. So when we hear the gospel, and we believe and put our faith in Christ. I'm sorry, my eyes are killing me. I couldn't find my glasses. When we um when we are regenerated and we're made alive, um, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. And Christ will shine on us. So now the Holy Spirit is indwelt in us, and we need to walk according to we need to walk according to um the standard which God calls us to walk in because now we're representatives of Christ. We're representing him. Like Christian literally means to be Christ-like. So you hear all the time um, people who just make fools of themselves and then other people will talk about them, which is also slander and gossip, um, which we learned about a little bit earlier. But that's wrong too. That doesn't make it good either. But it's, it's the same sin as the person who fell. But the, the point is that um, these people who they'll see this Christian do something really crazy or this pastor or this church member or whatever the case may be. And they'll say, DK Christians, uh, they sin harder than we do. They do more sin than we do. The Christians, they're always out to do a disaster. So it's, it's very important for us um, to live a life that's uh, representing Christ. So you need to remember we're no longer living for ourselves and our our flesh and our sinful nature if we're living to please the flesh still you might want to just sit for a moment pray really examine your heart and see if you truly have faith in Christ because it, it you you can't love your sin love to indulge in yourself and call yourself an ambassador for Christ at the same time because there was no sin in Christ. I, we know that he was God. Obviously, none of us are going to be perfect and sinless. There was only one because he's God and dwelt in the flesh. Um, he was not um, like we are born in sin. Christ was perfect. So we need to, not, not that we'll ever be sinless, um, but we need to watch our conduct. And that's the warning he gives us at first. And then he says in part B, he says, not as unwise, but as wise. So what does it mean to be wise or to have wisdom? What does that mean? Um, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 9, verse 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No, that always confused me as a kid. I was going, why? I thought fear is not from God. Why are we supposed to fear God? How is that the beginning of wisdom? It was very confusing when I didn't know the gospel. Um, but this doesn't mean to have like a worldly fear of God. Like, like you know that fear you have when you watch a horror movie and you got that NASA feeling and then you shut the lights off and you try to run up the stairs real fast because you think something's behind you. That's not the fear this is talking about. Um, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What that means is like that, that's to have like a, a reverence for God. That's, that's um, think of like your father or your papo. I know I'm close with my father to where he's like my friend. Um, but like there's, there's other people in my life that I would respect in a sense if you have reverence for them and your lajav and there's certain things you won't do around them. Um, and what they say goes. So that's, in a sense, um, that's how we should have reverence for God. That's like a little model, a small piece of it. Um, but when we fear the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. So when we acknowledge him as holy and righteous and just, that is the beginning of wisdom. That's to be wise, is to understand that. Um, so a worldly wisdom is not really wisdom at all. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So Albert Einstein, everybody heard of Albert Einstein. I don't care you went to school, you don't grew up plum, never watched TV day in your life. Somehow you know who Albert Einstein is. Um, he was considered the smartest man uh, alive um, to live on this earth. He was very smart. He knew a lot of things. He could come up with these crazy equations, but he denied the existence of the God of the Bible. 
Um, he didn't believe in an afterlife. And he said, he, this is one of his statements. He said, one life is too much for me. So he had all this knowledge, all this, this he's so smart. And he, he was one of the greatest, um, most smartest men who ever walked this earth. But at the same time, he lacked wisdom. Um, and the, the reason for this is because um, an atheist or an agnostic um, or somebody who says, I, I don't believe in the God of the Bible. I believe God is, God could be anything. It's just a higher power. It's not a, it's not a personal, God is not a personal being. God doesn't have uh, a voice. God doesn't have um, these standards. God is just energy. People say this all the time. This teaching is creeping into the church today. And this is why it's important to know these things. Um, so people who say these things are inconsistent with their own thought. For example, Ab Albert Einstein, right? Big, smart guy. He denies the existence of the God of the Bible, but he didn't deny God altogether. He said, I don't know, maybe there is a God, but I don't think God is the way the Bible says God is. Um, so by doing that, he... Thank you. By doing that, he... Um, denying the god of the bible he's inconsistent with his own belief because um if there's this god who isn't personal isn't all-knowing is just energy floating then it's not god it's not god um i think i'm pretty sure albert einstein believed in a big bang theory which means the universe created itself out of nothing that it, it's honestly harder to believe that than to believe the god of the bible exists um Point being, you could have all this evidence. There's artifact after artifact. Um, you could read article after article. You name it, all this proof. History itself speaks of the proof that um, God, the God of the Bible is true. His word is true. Uh, Jesus Christ really did exist. Um, he really did raise on the third day. Like all these things, you can find historical proof for it. But it doesn't matter how much proof you give these people if the Holy Spirit doesn't work in their heart, if they're not made alive, um, if they're not given a new heart, then it's nothing. Um, it, if anything, it hardens them even more and makes them more angry towards God and they're storing up more wrath for themselves. So it, it's literally the work of the Holy Spirit is for you to even understand these things, for you to even gain wisdom and to have fear of the Lord in the first place is a work of the Spirit. So Proverbs um, is often called the book of wisdom, and it gives us godly precepts on how to live our lives, how to raise our children, how to care for one another. And Paul is saying here, be careful not to practice uh, a life like the world does, but live a life of being filled with the spirit, which we'll read more about in a few minutes. Amen. Then and he goes in the second verse, making the best use of time because the days are evil. I mean, this verse pretty much speaks of itself, uh, speaks for itself. It doesn't need much explaining. Make the best use of your time because the days are evil. Um, so we live in this evil, fallen world because we are still in these sinful bodies. So we'll never be totally without sin until we're glorified in heaven um, and given new bodies, right? So we're still going to be in the sinful world. We're still tempted uh, with sin at every moment. Um, we still, we still have flesh, so we still do these things that are wrong, um, and we can't even call them mistakes. Because we're still in our flesh, we're still going to have sin. I mean, Paul himself said, um, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Um, that's because we're still in this fallen world. Now, um, we are not to waste our time with the foolishness of this world. Now, remember how I just talked about how, um, like an unbeliever, you could give them all this evidence. You can do all these things, show them all this information, right? You could try to persuade them all you want, but you cannot persuade someone to believe the gospel. That's the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit alone. That's God who um, needs to call them. They can't, they can't choose God for themselves. They're dead in their sins. We read about that in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. 
um, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, sons of disobedience. That was us at one time before Christ. Um, so you could give all this information to these people, but we need to understand sometimes when we're trying to debate, even with people who um, consider themselves believers or calling themselves believers, they're in the church, they're teaching these false doctrines as we learned a little bit like Bonnie taught about, um, and we're trying to expose their deeds of darkness, we need to be careful too um, how we do it um, because if we're if we're giving them too much information, we end up getting frustrated and it's very easy for us to fall in sin because these days are evil. So we need to be on watch. We need to be on guard. We need to have discernment. Um, we need to really, really watch the way we say things sometimes because um, even though we're right, we could sometimes make ourselves wrong. Um, I know a few times I had uh, a debate with people trying to tell them that no, eternal security is real and it, here it is, it's in the Bible and it says it here and it says it here and it says it here and it says it here. People would still deny it, uh, start attacking me personally and then I would get upset and do the same thing back. So I fell into the same sin. So I, that's bad. That's, that's wrong for um, somebody who is an ambassador of Christ. So this is what Paul is warning against. Make the best use of your time because the days are evil. Um, so let me, let me read it together, together. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. So that's it. It's pretty much saying pick your hills to die on. You don't, not everything needs to be argued. Um, like secondary issues are not really that big of a deal. It doesn't, it doesn't, we don't need to be pulling teeth over what style uh, of music your church plays when they sing um, but it is something to argue about when it comes to what they're singing about do you see how it's different so if you're singing a song of worship to God and it's saying complete heresy and it's contradicting what the word of God says and it's contradicting who the spirit is and it's blaspheming God's name that is something that needs to be corrected by fellow brothers in Christ but we are to correct with gentleness love self-control all these things can be done though with the filling of the spirit so verse 3 says therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the lord is now you may ask yourself too as as i have most of my life lord i want to know what your will is show me what your will is for me lord show me what you want for me um but the answer to that question was in a book collecting dust on my shelf the whole time if you want to know God's will for you, you open his word. He speaks to us through his word. Um, I wanted God to speak to me in a voice and tell me whether or not to do this or that, whether it be the smallest thing to the biggest thing, in, in my eyes, the biggest thing. Um, I wanted God to speak to me directly in a voice and to tell me how to do this and how to do that. But that's not how God works. He speaks to us through his word and everything we need to know is in here. Remember that we say that it's inerrant. It's without error. There's no missing information. Um, there's no subject that the Bible doesn't speak on it. Everything pertaining to life and death is in this book. So everything you need to know is already in his word. We don't need a new revelation. We don't need um, somebody who's going to say they, oh, God showed that God spoke to them and God told them that the world's going to end um, December 26th um, 2024. Like that contradicts what the word of God says, first of all. Second of all, he doesn't need to speak through people like that. He already told us in his word. And he also told us that nobody knows the day or the hour um, when he'll be coming back for his church. So why would God lie on himself? Why would the spirit deceive like that? Um, it, it, when we want to know God's will, it's, it's in his word. And you'd probably be shocked um, to know that the will of the Lord doesn't always have to be for you. Like, what is God's will in my life? What is what is the gift that God gave me in my life that I could use? Do you know that it's it's a it could be a gift from God for you to be a good mother, a good wife, a loving daughter, um, a person who has self control, a person who is patient, um, somebody who is loving, somebody who is good with children, somebody who can help the elderly, uh, somebody who is gifted in music, somebody who is was smart in their reading, um, somebody who has knowledge, experience, 
these are things that um, could be the, the Lord's will could just be for you to stay at home and teach your children uh, godly precepts and to teach younger women godly precepts and to listen to the older woman uh, like his word tells us. We find that in his word. So it's not rocket science. It's not a mystery. It's not like a magic eight ball that you shake and you ask God, oh Lord, should I do this? Yes or no? Should I buy this car? Should I get this watch? Yes, we are to pray for all things and ask God for all things. But it comes to a point where we need to have reverence and we need to have that um, acknowledgement that God is holy and righteous and just. And by that, I mean, God is not going to, God is not going to twist his word for you to get your way because that's not the God of the Bible. That's an idol that you made in your heart. You made a God in your own image, uh, a God who just wants to give you all your fleshly desires and that's a problem. Um, so God doesn't speak to his people in his voice anymore because we have his written word in full. Uh, the canon is closed. You probably heard this before, meaning that the Bible is complete. We have full revelation in front of us and we neglect it. We're ungrateful, uninterested, and undeserving. There's Gajay and the Tema who would give everything, everything to have what we have. Freedom to read the word of God wherever, whenever. We can go anywhere and buy a Bible. We can go anywhere and talk about the Bible. We can pray in public. We can meet together in, in our churches, in our buildings. Uh, we can build one another up. There's people in China. And maybe you think that, oh, China, they're not home. So what? No, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because no vita matters when it comes to God. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. who are suffering in China where it's, it's banned. The Bible is banned. It's not allowed. And if you're caught with the Bible or a fragment of the Bible or, or talking about Jesus Christ in general, you'll be, you'll be murdered. Um, it, there's a lot of places you see executions happening in Palestine um, and all over um, Iraq and these places where they, they don't want to hear the word of God. In Korea, they have public execution. In North Korea, if, if you're caught reading the word of God, you will be publicly executed. They go underground to meet together. So we have such a privilege, such a privilege to have the full written word of God and we neglect it. And I'm talking about myself here too. I'm not just talking to anybody else. I'm talking to myself as well. I, the Lord opened my eyes. He saved me from my sin. He reached down in my rebellion, pulled me out of it and opened my eyes that I can read his word and I can read it clearly and understand it now. Um, and I don't, I don't do as much as I should. I should be living reading his word every day. I should be in prayer 24 seven for all that He's done and continuously does for me, not just in, in the small little gifts that he gives us in, in this life, but salvationally, he gave me eternal life. And I, I can never be grateful enough for that. Um, but sometimes we don't show it in our actions. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Amen. Um, so Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So the Bible clicks, speaks clearly on what the will of the Lord is. On every single page, you will find it. Uh, his will is for us as, a, as Christians, representative of Christ, is to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called, sanctification. Uh, not to be foolish like we once were before we heard about Christ, but to have discernment, which can only be made possible by the Holy Spirit. As we mature as Christians, we grow in discernment. Um, now we're going to go into verse 18. where it, 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 Verse 18 is where it kind of, when I first read this, I was like, hmm, that's weird. Why are they making this comparison? It seems odd and out of place on the surface when you first read it. But when you break it down, you'll get a better understanding. Also, like... I'm going to teach a little bit of the background of why Paul is saying this to the church in Ephesus, but also to us today, um, and why this is being said, and what that means for us. So, there's, um, let's read verse 18. Verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, 
for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's two statements here um, before the filling of the Spirit. So part A of this verse, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So there's two statements. One is negative. One is positive. The negative statement being drunk with wine and the positive being filled with the Spirit. And it is followed by the next verse, which talks about um, singing hymns and songs. And why is that? Why is it? Why is it either you could be drunk or you could be singing? Why? Why did Paul make that um, contrast? What, what was the what, what's the connection there? Uh, so two things. First, the word debauchery is defined as an excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. And forgive me, girls, for some of the language I'm going to use, but it's God's word. I have to be obedient and I have to talk about these things. So um, debauchery is defined as excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. So why did he say don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit? The Gentiles, um, before they were saved, the pagans, this is what the pagans did back in Bible times, um, their religion, what they would do is they would get drunk to communicate with their gods. Um, so they believe that if you get really, really drunk, and if you eat a whole bunch, you eat, 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 and make yourself throw up, and then eat again, eat, 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 then you get drunk, and then um, they would go into the, they would go into the, um, temples with the Athenian prostitutes. Um, they would do very, very ugly things. But in, and the reason they would do this is because they believed that if you heightened all your senses to the max, if you heighten yourself in this indulgence, and you heighten yourself in these pleasures in the flesh, that you'll be able to communicate with God. And they would speak to this so-called gods, but it was really demonic. It was demonic entities. They were literally communicating with uh demonic spirits um and this is important because remember they would get drunk um to, to have this feeling this is why alcohol today if you go to a liquor store it'll they'll have a sign above it that says spirits um because that's what was believed back then is if you would you would drink enough that you would um be able to communicate with these spirits so that's why they're called spirits um they believed to indulge in carnal stimulation is how you communicate with the gods. And the same thing, you would think that that's crazy and people would never do that today. No, the same thing is happening today. Uh, people do LSD, it's drugs, it's a hallucinogen. Um, you've probably heard of like magic mushrooms and stuff like that. It's always on like TV shows and movies and whatever. Um, and even today, like there's this big thing about like Megan Fox going into the woods and she does... Uh, this special plant that gets her and her uh, her boyfriend high together. And they, she literally said, I went to hell. I met the devil. I seen God. This is their supposed experience on these drugs. Um, and the world still does it today. They believe that if you, you know, you get high, you, you have an outer body experience, you astral project, and now you're enlightened and you could speak to these spirits. So this is what they believed before. And this is why Paul is telling them, um, to put away that don't be don't be filled with wine don't be drunk with wine for that is debauchery it's debauchery is a really really hard word it's a it's I explained it earlier but like they would do all these things that we read about before that Candy talked about um, the immorality and the impurity and the sensuality and then uh, getting drunk and the gluttony and all these evil things they would do um and now they converted to christ and there was people in the church telling me you could still do these things um and they were still doing these things they were still getting drunk um in contrast to that is how the christians commune with god so they would claim that they're communicating with god by getting high and elevating the flesh um, but the way christians communicate with god is um they is to love god to enjoy god to serve God, not by pleasing the flesh, but being filled with the spirit. Um, so that's that's how we commune with God. It's through prayer. Um, we enjoy him by loving him. We serve him. Uh, and we kill the flesh. We put off the flesh. So do you see how it's the exact opposite of 
like what it used to be. So why would you carry, why would you carry your old ways into your new life? It doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of things I want to talk about here. So being filled with the spirit, when you think of being filled with the spirit, what do you think of? Where does your mind go? Um, because I used to think that being filled with the with the spirit means it's a it's an euphoric euphoric event. It's a feel good. It's a high. You feel dizzy. You feel lightheaded. The room smells nice. Everybody's singing in one unison. And you get shaky and you get goosebumps and you just feel like the presence of the Lord is there. That is not being filled with the spirit. You know, being filled with the spirit is a constant way of life. It's not. A momentary experience but it is living an entire life being moved along and kept by the spirit so the book of acts that's why the pagans have, okay another point i wanted to make um do you guys remember in the book of acts i think it's chapter two where they start speaking in tongues um they, they the holy spirit came upon them they were speaking in different tongues there was prophecy um there was actual um You've seen the spirit uh, manifested in, in that way at the time in Acts. And the pagans came along and they said, it's morning and they're already drunk. Now, why did they say that? I always thought, oh, they said they thought they were drunk because being filled with the spirit is those people like, because uh, we see we see through the Pentecostal movement, through this charismatic movement, people who they say you get drunk on the spirit, right? So they're falling over, they're shaking, they have no self control, they're laughing for no reason. They call it holy laughter. Now I grew up seeing this kind of stuff, and when I thought like what it said in Acts, where they thought people were drunk, um, that's what the charismatics use to justify. Um, the pure evil act that's going on in the churches today. It's pure evil, pure evil. Um, but that's what was taught to us all these years that, oh, that's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is here as if, as if God isn't omnipresent, as if we're not sealed with the Spirit, as if the Spirit doesn't live with us and dwell in us, as if we're not the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit is a feeling that comes and goes. And uh, I miss feeling the Spirit. I need to go back to church. I need to get to the altar so I can feel the Holy Spirit. Well, our emotions are subjective. So our emotions change. God is unchanging. Um, our emotions can be, I can be euphoric one moment and the next moment I can be depressed. I can be happy one moment, the next moment I can be mad. The, the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Um, I'm gonna show you an example of what, what the Holy Spirit doesn't look like, okay? This is what the Holy Spirit doesn't look like and it's a little bit scary, but I think it's important to show. Let's see. You guys can see I'm not gonna put the volume on, but I just want to show. This is um what I was brought up to think that uh the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is. This is what I thought um being filled with the spirit looks like. And I thought being filled with the spirit was a thing that needed to happen all the time. Like you'd be filled and then you leave and you're empty and you need to go get filled again. And then um the shaking and the screaming. That is not the Holy Spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. We know that because his word says that um, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. These are people who do not have self-control. These are people who don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, this is why they call it drunk in the spirit because they have no control. They're under the influence of something else and blaspheming by calling it um, the Holy Spirit. They're calling it a work of the spirit. This is, it reminds me of um, like when the Pharisees tried to say that Jesus uh, cast out the dev uh, demons by, because he, he was possessed by demons. Um, that's, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because if, if this is, if this is, if I'm wrong, and if this is the filling of the Holy Spirit, then there's a problem with God's word. The Bible is not true. And if one part of the Bible is not true or inconsistent, then why take any of it? Why? Why take any of what we believe from the Bible? Why pick and choose? If there's one lie in it, the whole thing is a lie. Um, so either 
this is wrong or God's word is wrong. There's some people will disagree. Some people will say, no, no, no. Well, that's too extreme. You know, a little bit of shaking, a little bit of feel good. That's okay. Um, the whole, okay, I'll tell you this. This is what I've learned. That's not how the Holy Spirit does the jazz hands. I encourage the believers to have a quiet spirit, amen, and a contrite heart of self-control. So that is not, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. Um, being filled to be filled with the Spirit is not coming and going. Actually, let me open up my notes again. So I wanted to. Okay, now that I shared that video, and we know that that's not the filling of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand that the the filling of the Spirit that's being talked about here. When we think of filling, we think of. Let me do a quick illustration as best as I can. We think of filling of the spirit like this, right? Filling up, filling up with the spirit, to be filled with the spirit. This is not this is not the filling that we're talking about. Why? Because it's stagnant and this water is staying. And once it's filled, it either stays filled. It's it doesn't move, right? It's stagnant. So this this type of being filled with the spirit is um the way john macarthur explained it it's like it's like wind filling filling the um the the sails of a sailboat the you know the thing that they put up that helps the helps the boat be carried along that's the kind of filling um that it's talking about it's not talking about to be filled up it's to be filled through um so to be filled with the spirit is to be living a life um and constant, it's a constant way of life, right? And it's progressive. It happens throughout your life. It doesn't start and stop. It's not a one-time event. It's not a, some kind of mystical thing. It's not gold dust flying out of the, the air vents. It's not uh, repeating the same word over and over and over again like a chant. That's not what it is. Um, the Holy Spirit is the being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that you get a different voice, that your eyes change, that you shake. That's that's not what the Bible tells us. Uh, the Bible speaks of different fillings, and this will kind of give us an idea of what does it mean to be filled through, right? So, uh, for contrast, the Bible speaks of differing different. I'm sorry, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> different fillings of things. Um, in John 16, we read about. Being filled with sorrow. In Luke 5, we read about being filled with fear. In Luke 6, we read about being filled with madness. Acts chapter 6, we read about being filled with faith. And um, in Acts chapter 5, it tells us of a man named Ananias who was filled with Satan. So to be filled with something, that something is, that means that that something is the dominating force. That's what this filling is talking about. Um, so in the original language, this could be translated, this, um, to be filled with the spirit could be translated like this in English, uh, being kept, be being kept continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you hear how urgent that is? Um, be being kept continuously filled with the Holy Spirit to be continually under the control of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a work called sanctification, like we talked earlier. Sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit, um, but we also have a part in this as well. So sanctification and being filled with the Spirit, we have a part in it too. Um, we need to have obedience to and faith in Christ. Um, so when we are obedient to Christ, um, that is a part of our sanctification. So the, the spirit does the work on the inside and then our obedience needs to act that out on the outside. And this is why we fail to do that sometimes because it's not that the Holy Spirit isn't capable. It's that we um, love our sin sometimes too much and we're not broken enough by our sin. and We're not in the word enough because when we're in the word and the more we read, the more our heart breaks over these things and the more we don't want to do these things. And that's sometimes why we stay away. Um, when we're going through something and we're frustrated, we're upset, and we know that we're in our hearts and in our minds, we're sinning. We know that. And we run from God's word. We don't want to read it. We don't want to pray. Why? Because we know that his word is going to point the finger back at us. Um, for a long time, I couldn't forgive um, these people who hurt my family. For five and a half years, I held on to hate in my heart. 
and I did not want to hear a preaching. I didn't want to hear a song. I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to do any of these things. I wanted to sit there and soak in my anger. You could you could say that I was being under the influence of my anger. My anger overtook me. The hatred overtook me. That bitter root grew and it, it didn't get cut off and it and became part of me. And that's what I was. And I was a very ugly person for those five years. Um, you could have seen what was going on in my heart was visible on the outside. And it's so easy um, because we're of this world to to do things of the flesh. Like it's easier for me uh, to use this horrible language, to use this, um, how does it say it here? But to use this bad words, that's the best way I could point to, to say these curses and to do these things. It's so easy, it comes so natural to me. But when I read God's word and I have to say the hard words, I think about it, but why is it that like I could be in front of everybody and I could, you know, curse people out and it, it's okay. It comes natural to me. Um, it's because we need, the more we read the word, okay, the more we read God's word, the more we seek him, the more we kill the flesh uh, and walk in the spirit, the more we are being sanctified. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing that happens over time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, Babies in Christ will be very different from somebody who's been a true Christian for 40 years. Different maturity levels, uh, different things going on. But ultimately, we all have the same command. Um, so 1 Peter 1 verses 15 through 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now the word Holy or holiness is described as a life of total devotion to God. And that is not possible on our own at all. In fact, the Bible says otherwise. Um, I can't live a life in total devotion to God, especially if I don't know the gospel. It's impossible. I can't 100% I can't devote my life to God. I still got things to do. I still got um, things I want to see. I still want to, I still want to have a glove. I still want to go to Hawaii. I still want to go on vacation and live my life. That is not, that's indulging um, in the pleasures of this world. That's wrong. That's the Bible tells us to do otherwise. It tells us to be filled with the spirit. Hi, Rebecca. God bless you. Um, so here's, here's what the Bible tells us um, about if you think you could live a life of total devotion to God. Here's what the Bible says. And this this part I'm going to talk. I'm going to preach the gospel. Um, just reading. Just by the reading of his word. And I think it's important to put it here before we go on. Um, because one, we can't assume that everybody here knows the gospel. Even though we're all believers um, in the room. It's just, um, you know, the, the word. His, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it's the gospel alone that can save. Not me. Not any of the teachings, not any live streams, not any songs, not any shaking or uh, any of those things can save. It's only um, by the gospel that we can get saved. So can can we live a life of total devotion to God? Can, can you really do it? Um, here's what the Bible says. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Um, Romans 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. For ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. 
and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve a creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their woman exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossipers, slanderers, haters of God. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And um, when you read things like that, and then you read um, in Isaiah about God's holiness and who he is and and Isaiah says, woe is me, um, for I'm a man of unclean lips. When you look at God's standard, when you look at his perfection, you see that God demands perfection. He says, be holy, for I am holy. And this talks about us. This is who we are. We exchange God for an idol. We try to make God in our image. We try to bend God to how we want things done. And it breaks my heart because I know that I'm saved now. I know that um, I have salvation and I'm, I'm going to give you the good news in a minute. There is good news, so it's not all bad. It just, there's something we need to talk about is that people are going to hell. People are dying and they're going to hell. And nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care. These People will sit there and they'll preach for hours about how you need to be perfect and you need to be good and you need to you need to stop sinning. Just stop sinning. Come to church. Put a suit on. Put a watch on. Get a job in church and you're good to go. If you do good works, you're saved. And the Bible tells us that's not what's going to happen. But these same guys who preach that you need good works in order to be saved. A man who will die of a drug overdose, leave his wife and his children to live on the streets, to do immoral acts. And even though he professed Christ, he did the sinner's prayer when he was about 12 years old, went on to never go back to the church. Not that church saves you, but a, a truly saved person would want to be together with fellow believers. This man showed no fruit, showed nothing, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. They'll go on the pulpit and they'll preach it from the comfort of the pulpit, but nobody will get there, go to them face to face and tell them, brother, you need to stop. You're on the road to hell. And then even worse, when these people die, when they die in their sin and they die of these diseases, they go there to their funeral and they have the nerve to say, oh, well, he's in a better place now to make the family feel better. We know that he had some trouble, but we know that he's with Jesus. He got the sinner's prayer when he was 10. So all of a, all of a sudden, they believe in eternal security. When they, don't give, when they don't give people the gospel, they never do. And this really, it, it really hurts me on the inside. Not only because I dealt with this for a long time, with thinking that I need to work my way to salvation, literally tried to bear weight that we weren't meant to bear, that Christ bore for us. We try, we try in our own efforts to try to, to try to work our way to heaven. But the problem is that it doesn't matter how many good works we do. Uh, the book of James tells us if, if we broke one law, we have broke them all. And you can't rewrite your wrongs. So 
Ephesians 2, before we got here, says, um, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work at the sons of disobedience, among whom all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's where... In, in three, it, it talks about our dead state. This is our natural state. We're all born into this. You don't become a sinner over time. You're born a sinner. Um, David says, in, um, in sin, my mother conceived me. Um, I always make this joke to the girls, the Athenes, but I, I always make this joke and say, we're doomed from the womb. Um, and that's exactly how it is. We were, we're all born in sin. We're all born with the sickness, the disease of sin. Um, and there's no way to cleanse ourselves. We could we could wash all we want, but we're just washing the outside of the glass, and the inside is still dirty. Um, so God did something beautiful, and this is this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is why it's called the good news, because we're going to continue on right after it says um, we were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by children nature uh, by. Nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you can't even boast in the good works that you do after you're saved. It's God who, who, God created, God made you to do these things. It was predestined before the foundations of the world. It says the, the, that we were predestined before the foundations of the world. So God chose you in him. If you, if you believe in your heart, if you believe the gospel, if you believe that Christ lived in our place, died in our place, arose on the third day. That is not because you believe. You can't even boast in that. It is God who did the work in you and opened your eyes and caused you to believe. Um, Romans 8, 1 says, there, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter three eighteen says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And this is the good news of the gospel, that this is what sets us free. So we were doomed going to hell by our own will, wanting to be there, um, by our free will. Our free will choice is always hell. Um, and I can tell you from experience in my life, in my testimony, I was an atheist. I hated God. I didn't want God in my life. I was angry at him um, because I wanted him to do things my way. And I didn't like that this God had rules. And how dare God be a jealous God? And how dare he send people to hell for no reason? I was wrong. Um, I was wrong. We were all wrong about what we thought about God at one point in our lives. Um, but God reached down in my rebellion and he dragged me, dragged me from my sin, dragged me from the death that I was going to die. He dragged me from the old life, the dead state. He made me alive. He gave me a new heart as well as he did for all of you. Maybe you don't know the exact moment as well as I don't. I can't give you an exact date and time when I got saved. I feel like there was a lot of things. Um, that led up to that, but um, I can't put an exact moment on it. But I know that it was it was only God who could have done that for me. I didn't look for God. He came, he came after me. I wasn't looking. I didn't want him, 
and he came after me. He gave me a heart like he did um, for Paul. Paul was um, going on the road to Damascus and, and he had to be blinded. He was blinded and then Jesus told him, why are you persecuting me? And those, when those scales fell off, he stopped everything. And he, the same man who would murder the Christians, put them to death, is now um, one of the most influential Christians of all time. We read um, about the Apostle Paul all the time. So the good news of the gospel is that we're set free from our sin. It doesn't have a hold on us anymore. We don't have to live that way. We, we don't have to, to die in our sins. We don't have to go to hell. Christ made a way. Um, and though once would uh, scarcely do a good thing for a good person, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. It's not that he waited for us to be good. Because we can never be good on our own. Because all goodness flows through him. So the importance to that is that now that we know that we are set free from our old life. Um, now we need to live a life of holiness. Which we were never able to accomplish on our own. I don't care how many good works you do. It's not being holy. Because even our good works um, that we claim that we try to claim is not even our own doing. So we, we we're, we were never able to accomplish holiness. We never, if you don't believe it, look at, look at the, the Levitical priest. The Levitical priest would sit, and I know I'm going along girls, but I, I just, I just need to talk about this. It's been weighed heavy on my heart. There's nothing I can do to get my salvation. I cannot lose my salvation if I'm really saved because the Bible says he will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. Yep, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches, that he keeps us. Um, I'm sorry, where was I? So now we need to live a life of holiness that we were never able to accomplish on our own um, in the first place. But we can now because we are sealed with the Spirit. So um, when we are made alive with Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Spirit. Now, you just need to really pay attention here because it gets a little bit tricky. And I really pray that the Lord will let me explain this correctly. Um, so every believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a believer who was sealed with the Spirit and then was unsealed with the Spirit and then got the Spirit back. That don't exist. That means that if that person is sealed and unsealed, they were never sealed in the first place because God doesn't make mistakes. God is not a God of trial and error. He's going to give you a chance. Then he's not God. If God has to depend on God works depending on our actions, then God is not God. We are God. God is not sovereign. We are sovereign. So we really, really, really need to pay attention to this. Every believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit. When you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, that is, um, it's like a, a deposit a down payment, it's the guarantee, the guarantee of our inheritance. It's guaranteeing us a place in heaven. It means we're, it says we're already seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. We're already heirs with Christ. We're already there. Um, Ephesians 1.13, back in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantor of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So being, se being sealed with the spirit and being filled with the spirit is two different things. So remember that every believer, every believer is sealed with the spirit. Okay, Being filled with the spirit is not the same thing. You're not, as soon as you become a believer, you are filled with the Spirit. Because remember, we talked about how the filling of the Spirit is a, a continuous thing. It's called progressive sanctification. Um, so being sealed with the Spirit is a one-time thing. It doesn't happen over and over and over again. It doesn't happen once and then again twice. or it, It's once and that's it. And you can never be sealed and then unsealed. I talked about that already. The filling of the Spirit, though, is a continuous progressive process. So to be sealed with the Spirit is the guaranteed salvation, right? 
to be filled with the spirit is progressive sanctification. I think people, um, I did for a long time too. We get that confused girls. We get that, um, salvation and sanctification confused. We are saved by grace alone, um, through faith alone and Christ alone, according to scripture alone for the glory of God alone. So we, our salvation is set in. Our salvation, our performance doesn't guarantee our salvation. We're, we're already saved, right? But in order to be sanctified, we need to be filled with. So the filling of the Spirit is something that happens over time. So you can't be saying, not save, save, not save, like people who believe in work salvation. Exactly, right? So uh, a works-based salvation, for example, is every other religion except for Christianity. You go look it up. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm talking about this because it's, it's important to talk about too. Um, every other religion tells you to work for your salvation. Buddhism, Hinduism, um, paganism, Judaism, all these religions will tell you you need to work for your salvation. You need, if you do enough good things, you'll get to heaven, right? Or you'll get to nirvana or you'll get enlightened or you're going to get to wherever it is. Um, that's, that's not true. That's not true. The, the, the gospel, the Bible, Christianity is the only religion who says that our God died in our place, lived in our place, gave us his righteousness. We are saved by grace, not on the merit of works. Um, it's the only religion that's what separates Christianity from everybody else in the world. And that's something I needed to hear when I was 15 and an atheist and couldn't understand what was the difference between uh, how do we know which one is right? How do we know we have the right religion? religion? Um, that's how we know we have the right religion because they're all imposters of the same thing. Remember how we talked about earlier? It's the same sin, just packaged different ways. It's it's always been like that. It's just, they just put a new label on it and they think it's good. Um, but by faith alone, this is the only religion. It says grace alone, faith alone. Christ alone, according to scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Amen. So, talking about being sealed with the Spirit again, that's progressive sanctification that happens over time. Um, so, let's look at what are the effects of a Spirit-filled life. So, what, what, what does a Spirit-filled life look like? What does it do? Um, so, Galatians 5, 20 through 23 is the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody knows it, but I'm going to read it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. That is the aspects of a Spirit-filled life. And when you are being filled with the Spirit, these fruit are going to show in your life. And we already have these things available to us. We don't have to... We, we, we can't like work for the fruit of the spirit, right? Because it's the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of me. So it, the spirit does the, this work, okay? So that's one of the, 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 that's some of the effects that you'll see is the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, also, it talks about um, something else you'll see, the effects of a spirit-filled life a spirit-filled believer um will be somebody who walks in love gives thanks to god understands the will of the lord addressing addresses one another in psalms and hymns and songs um which we'll, we'll get to in a minute what that means um the fruit of the fruit of the spirit the, the spirit-filled life could look like a, a submissive wife to her husband a wife who respects her husband submits to him uh, it could look like a husband loving his wife as Christ loved the church, which we'll learn about next week. It'll look like children obeying their parents. It'll look like parents not provoking their children to anger. Slaves obeying masters and masters being kind to their slaves. Now, if you remember when I just read in Romans um, and Ephesians about our state before we were saved is the exact opposite of these things. So our, our natural reaction is to do the exact opposite of these things where it tells us not to do. This is what is natural to us. But we need to kill um, ours. We need to have less of us and um, more of him. We must decrease and he must increase. And that is how we have this spirit-filled life. So 
what, uh, if you guys ever heard of something called the cause and the effect, right? So the effect is, is what's going to show, right? It's going to be the proof. Um, and then the cause of these things. So how, how do we, how is how are these things even caused? How do we even want to have a spirit filled life? If you go to second Corinthians three eighteen, um, it says this, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. As we look to Christ, and we look to his perfection, and which is revealed to us through scripture, right? So we look to Christ, we look at the life he lived, we look at his love, we look at his peace, his patience, all, all the attributes he showed, all the love and kindness he showed, um, and we read about this through the scripture. The spirit takes the spirit takes this truth, and by the means of his power, shapes us and molds us into the image of Christ. The goal is eternal transformation. So that's the cause. This is how we could even want these things in the first place. Is is because we we look to Christ when we read his word. This is why his word is so important. It's essential to every believer. I don't care if you say I don't know how to read. There is no excuse anymore. Your phone will will read it for you. Your phone will give you all kinds of voices in between that. It'll play you the whole Bible and give you voice acting too. It's the best. So you have no excuse anymore. You have children who can read. You have people who can explain it to you. Um, we all know at least one pastor. Um, if you don't know a pastor, if you want to ask somebody a question, you, you can go. There's Instagram, there's social media. You have access to anybody right now. So there is no excuse for you not to read God's word. If you're a believer, you need to be reading God's word, listening to God's word, praying, seeking the truth. This is essential to the Christian life. It's not optional. This is what a Christian does. And if you're not doing these things, again, we need, you need to examine yourself, examine your heart, and see whether you're in the faith or not. Because a Christian can't live like that. They can't. Um, so let's see. As we look to Christ's perfection. To, okay, so John MacArthur quoted this. And I'm going to quote it because it was beautiful. He said, To be filled with the Spirit is not a mystical uh, thing. It's not an experiential thing. It is to be consumed with Christ. That is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You're so consumed by Christ and his love and what he'd done for us and God. Being rich in mercy. Sending his son to come to us in, in our weakness. Meaning he, we, we don't serve a God who, who doesn't understand. We don't serve a God who... Uh, never experienced pain, never experienced suffering, didn't experience stress or anxiety. We have a God who's personal. He stepped into our world, his world, and he put us in. He stepped into to our state and lowered himself to our, our, our playing field, I would say. God forgive me if I'm using the wrong words. Um, but he, he lowered himself. Um, and submitted himself and he was he was so humble even to the point of death on a cross and we have the nerve to be prideful we have the nerve um, we say lord lord forgive me for this because i've been struggling with this for a while and i don't want to cry i don't want to make this emotional because it's not about me but you just think about these things and it blows your mind because i have a nerve to say lord it's too much I can't take it anymore. It's too much. It's too heavy. And we don't know what that means. We don't know what that means, heavy. Um, the only one true person who experienced the weight of the world on his shoulders was Christ. Christ Jesus, he really did. He, Chuch has took that, that saying and put it to truth. He did carry the weight of the world on his shoulders. The party must you feel. How much more? Did Christ have to feel facing the full wrath of God? The full wrath of God was poured out on the only innocent man who ever lived. There was none innocent. There was no one righteous we just read. There was only one. And it's because he is God in the flesh. That's the reason why. 
and that the fullness of the wrath of God was poured out on Christ on our behalf. And we have the nerve to complain. We have the nerve to not be joyful in our salvation. We need to be consumed with Christ. Girls, this is not an optional thing. It's not. I'm not trying to be emotional. I'm not trying to stir you up and to, to make you feel much. Oh, empowered. No. I pray that you feel convicted as I do. Um, because my heart is broken with this study. Of my selfishness. So, I'm praying that the Lord would break um, your ego as the way he's breaking mine. We are um, commanded not to grieve the spirit. Ephesians 4, 4.30. So what does it mean to grieve the spirit, right? Um, so we learned earlier in chapter 4 that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And how do we grieve him by the foolish, corrupt talk, the crude joking, the slandering, the gossiping, practicing immorality, impurity, greed, filthiness. These are things that um, we do that grieves the Holy Spirit. Because I was taught for a long time, and maybe you were too, that when we sin, the Holy Spirit leaves. The Holy Spirit can't handle sin, so he has to leave. No, the Holy, we're sealed with this Holy Spirit. But we still live in these sinful bodies, and we still, um, you know, still like our flesh sometimes. We need to be humbled every now and then, and I thank God that he does that for me but there's times when we go off tracks a little bit and we're totally comfortable in our flesh um and that is when we're grieving the holy spirit the holy spirit ain't gonna leave you you're sealed with him it's it's a deposit it, you didn't obtain the holy spirit it wasn't because you got it's an achievement like oh I, I did all these good things i got the holy spirit no that's every other religion teaches that that's, that's enlightenment that's false it's fake it doesn't it doesn't even really exist um, first Thessalonians tells us not to quench the first Thessalonians five, um, verse 19 says, um, it tells us not to quench the spirit and the word quench used there in first Thessalonians is like putting out a fire. Um, so it's, it tells us not to do that. Don't, don't, we can avoid quenching the spirit by reading further up. If you go, how, how do we not quench the spirit then? Um, first Thessalonians five. Um, and just a little bit further up uh, before we read in 19, um, it says, Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Uh, rejoice always, and pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Um, and then Galatians 5, again, where we just read the fruit of the Spirit. If you read a little further down the next couple of verses, 24 through 26 says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So what that's basically saying, and this pertains to the same thing with the filling of the Spirit, walking in step with the Spirit, um, is that when we believed in Christ, um, it's Galatians, I believe, 520, where Paul says, it's not, um, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's the attitude of every believer. And if you don't have that attitude, if you're not killing the flesh, if you still like your, if you're still living for yourself and to please yourself and, and to, to attain the, the best achievements, you're looking for awards and rewards and, and body mansa and to have a scumming and to have a handshake and to do, okay, it's fine to have a glove. It's fine to have a nice car. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house. Um, with dressing nice, there's nothing wrong with these things. Okay, it's it's not those things that are the problem. It's looking like the world that is the problem. Um, we read that Paul talks about how women are to dress, and he talks about women not braiding their hair and not wearing um, a lot of jewelry and even the makeup and stuff. Now, does this mean that as women we should never get dressed? 
N no, the reason he said that is because that's, this is how the pagans would dress when they would go do these things, when they would be prostitutes in, in temples, the pagans would do that. They would dress like that. So the, the point is we need to not look like the world. We are not of this world. We're sojourners. We're not, we're not supposed to be um, living the same way we did before. Do those things have you was the question? Yep, yeah, that is, that's right, Sam. Um, when we need to stop living like the world, we need to stop wanting to look like the world. We need to stop looking at the world and envying those things. Um, like people having a lot of money or people going on vacation or people who drive really nice cars, have nice watches. Um, no, the Kardashians is the number one thing I could point out. How many of us watched the Kardashians go to Bora Bora and were like, wow, I wish I had that. Wish I could go there. That looks fabulous. At the end of the day, their soul um, is going to hell. So you could have all those achievements. It don't mean nothing. This world is temporary. It's not forever. This is not, this is not where we're going to be forever. We all die. We all die. Um, and one day we're all going to have to face God. So if you can master up the courage to even say on that day, whenever it might be, whether the Lord wants to take us home now or if we all have um, our personal times to go home and be with the Lord, whenever that may be. But if you even have the courage to open your mouth and to say, well, I did this for you, Lord, and I did this for you, Lord. And didn't we cast out many demons in your name, Lord? Didn't we do these many miracles in your name? Didn't we Didn't we do mighty works in your name? Um, that's very scary to hear the words for God to say away from me, for I never knew you. Because when you try to get into heaven on your own righteousness and you think, <laughs> you think that, um, you know, living in the flesh and living in the things of this world and being frustrated um with god because you're not getting the sinful passions and desires that you have to be upset with god because you didn't make money today and you know that your business is wrong and you're lying and you're stealing and it's not an honest work with honest hands and you're you're upset you're lord you didn't provide today really like, really, we need to sit down and we need to have this talk with ourselves, girls. I'm talking about myself, too. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm the last person who, who can point a finger. If anything, I'm, I'm the biggest sinner of anybody in this group. But we really need to sit down and really examine our hearts and see, Lord, where am I asking you to bless that you already commanded me not to do? We need to ask ourselves that because you can't, we can't do this anymore. It's been too long. We need to grow in Christ. We need to mature. We need to move on from milk and move on to solid food eventually. The problem is the people who are upset work out are not satisfied in God. A true believer is satisfied in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's the next point I'm going to get into now. So... The result of the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So what happens when you get sanctified? What's the result of all this? Um, when you're being filled with the Spirit and you're walking by the Spirit, what's what's the result of it? What happens? What comes of that? The result of it is the next verse. And I know I still have a very long time, and I'm sorry, girls. It's been like two hours, but um, this is just how long the study is. <laughs> um so the next one, what it, the result of the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So 19, uh, 5, 19. Addressing one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we've got it's got a little weird okay i get all the don't drink i get that don't live in your old way of life be renewed by the spirit live walk in the spirit be filled with the spirit um be a new creation take on uh, christ likeness but now it's talking about singing so it's real simple um i didn't see it i had to read about it i didn't see it right away i had to read about it and when i read about it i was like oh why i didn't see that um we sing when we're joyful so when we are filled with the Spirit, we are joyful, and with joy comes music. 
So um, remember the fruit of the spirit is love. The second one is joy. Not that they're any in any specific order or that one's greater than another, but um, you're joyful. That you've ever heard um, like people say, like Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Uh, the joy of your salvation comes with singing and music. When we're happy, we sing. Um, throughout the Psalms, you'll read of. Uh, and it's, it's a whole bunch of different songs. I didn't write down exactly which ones. I know one is uh, Psalm 150 um, and one is Psalms 33. It says, uh, of read, you read of singing a new song uh, to the Lord. And that new song is to sing of our redemption, right? So the new song that we sing, we don't sing the old song that we used to anymore when we were dead in our sins. Um, we would sing and be content with listening to the worldly music and, and relate to it. And maybe you still relate to it today, um, but that's something you need to pray about because we need, we have a new song now that we sing. It's not the same old song. This is why it's been prayed, um, give us a new song, Lord. So it's singing of our redemption. That's the new song. And um, something I found out that blew my mind when I found out about it. Um, this is why we sing in a major key. This is why Christian songs are to be sang in a major key. If you know anything about music, the major key, like uh, G major, C major, D major, not minor keys. Um, now, if you know major keys sound very happy. So it's we're singing in a major key because we're singing of our redemption. It's it's a joyful thing. What a joy it is um, that we we are redeemed by our Savior. That he bought us, that he adopted us. We are now his children. That's so beautiful. It should be. It should be everybody's joy to sing of. And uh, Revelations five nine, um, we read about everybody in the future who's going up. They gather around the throne of God, um, singing a new song. Because they were singing a new song, um, not the song of our old lives, but a new song of our new life in Christ. So in heaven. In Revelation, we're going to be singing a new song to the Lord. Um, and that's of our life, our eternal life that's going to happen. Because um, we're just temporary right here. So another example I just wanted to give real quick is um, singing songs of, you know, spiritual songs. Singing to the Lord with your heart. So notice how it has to be done in the heart first before it can come out of your mouth. If you're not joyful in your heart to the Lord, it, it, you're not going to sing true songs of worship to God. Worship starts in the heart. Um, and worship is not just a song. That's another thing, too. Our everyday lives are um, should be worshiping God. And that's we could worship God, again, with how we just live our lives with our family, how we take care of our children, how we react when people say things to us that they shouldn't say. Um, that's that's giving worship to God. We give glory to God with how we live in our own homes. It starts in our homes. People think that worship is, uh, let, let's do a little worship. It has to be a song and there has to be a guitar and there has to be lights, music, and the mood has to be set. That's not what it's talking about. It says um, to, to making melody to the Lord with your heart. So your heart has to first change. And then the outward thing will happen um and if you're only worshiping god once a week on sunday when you got your favorite song on or you only stand up and you worship when you like the song that's not the way it goes we should always be singing songs of um praise and maybe not in our heart i'm talking about not just physically what i'm out because it's not by anything that we can do but that's what's already he's already done and that's the joy that we have um that we sing about um i can give an example of this so my grandmother Whenever we would um, go through like the biggest tragedies, like remember um, my father getting open heart surgery. My father had this one time where he had to get fake veins in his legs and we were all there and everybody was scared and shaking. My dad had a heart attack really bad one time. We didn't think he was going to survive. My grandmother was singing and she was getting mad at herself for singing. She was like, I don't want to sing. Why am I singing? And she couldn't stop singing um, songs of praise to God. And it would just, it would be a constant thing while she was just walking around. She would just be singing, singing to God. And she would, she would get mad sometimes. So she's like, I, I don't want to sing right now. We're going through too much. Um, 
but that was because the the joy of her salvation was in her heart so it could only come out it's something you can't you can't um express any other way but with singing so with that in mind um the last verse and we'll close with this um it says submitting to one another out of reverence for christ so this is the transitional verse this is the end of it so we read through the whole thing and the, the, the last part the breakdown is to mit, submitting to one another out of reverence for christ um so now we see the effects of being filled with the spirit um now we see the effects of being filled with spirit. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more you see the day drawing near. So there's, um, we read about it in, we read about it in Peter. Um, when we did the study of, of I think it was First Peter, how, uh, um, God put certain people in certain areas of authority and uh, we need to acknowledge that sometimes. It's, it feels like sometimes we don't, we kind of skip over that part and we forget about it. But um, God is the ultimate authority and he put other men in authority. Um, for example, Joe Biden. Don't like Joe Biden. I don't. I don't like his policies. I don't like anything but... God did put him in that office to bring about his purpose. What that may be, may that if, whether that's um, a judgment to the people of this nation who who want these corrupt leaders or whatever it might be, uh, the Lord did appoint him in that place. So we need to respect. We need to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now Paul was saying this because they were you know battling each other in the church, like we talked about uh, the former Jews and Gentiles, now one body, where um, they were trying to one-up one another and stuff. Well, my mom did that. My mom was in the hospital. So Amen. Um, so yeah, we need, we need to, what he's talking about here is to submit out of, to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we ultimately submit to Christ, right? He is Lord. We are um, his servants. We are fellow heirs with Christ, but he is our Lord. He's the Lord of our life, meaning he's the boss of our life. What he says goes. We don't live to please ourselves and our flesh anymore. Um, but our, our chief end now is to love God and enjoy him forever. That's, that's our main goal at this point. It's no longer living for yourself and trying to live a good reputation behind. So when you die, people will say how great of a person you are. Um, but our goal is to love God and enjoy him forever. And we can do that um, through the person of Jesus Christ who paid for us, redeemed us. So because we submit to him, ultimately, we must submit to one another. So we can't say, oh, we submit to Christ. Christ is my Lord. But I'm just going to rebel and cause all, I'm going to stir up all this, all this confusion. I'm going to, I'm going to try to, you know. For example, we're women, right? So it says that we need to be under our husbands. We need to submit to our husbands, right? So when a woman is trying to um, take control over the husband and be over the husband, that is not submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we're going to learn about that because literally the next thing that Candy and Chanel's talking about next week is... Um, talking about wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your wives um, and how that reflects uh, Christ, who is the, the, the bridegroom, and the church, which is uh, the bride. So that's going to be next week. We're going to talk about that, and um, I'm sure they're going to do wonderful with that. But that, that's just something to leave uh, you girls with. We need to remember our place um, and remember that God put other people over us for a reason. Um, and that when we're seeking peace with others, maybe maybe your husband um, is mean to you. Maybe he says things to you that you don't like. He gets on your nerve. He's rude to you. He's not, he's not loving his wife the way the Bible 
commands him to, right? He's being selfish. He only cares about himself. And it's hard. It's hard to submit to a man like that. It's hard. It's hard to be quiet and listen um, to a man who is rude to you. It's the truth. We all struggle with this. Every woman on here, I don't care how old, how young, whatever the case may be, how great your husband is. At one point, you wanted to slap him. Um, that's just the truth. But um, we, we're not supposed to do those things. We're not even supposed to lash out at them and try to take control and, and try to be over them. Um, why? Because we'll read about it next week how wives are to submit their husbands the way the church is to submit to Christ. So we need to do like Hebrews 10 says, um, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So that is that is the job of the believer now that we are spirit filled for spirit filled with the spirit if uh, Christ is our Lord if we're saved um, we believe that Jesus um, lived died rose again in our place um, we need to be living this way we need to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together um, as a habit of some but encouraging one another. And all the more you see the day drawn near. So that's what we need to do. God bless you girls. I know it was a lot. I was all over the place. I cried. I got emotional. I wasn't supposed to. But um, glory goes to God. It's just what he wanted me to talk about. A lot of it I got from John MacArthur and um, watching that sermon. And then just like what we've been learning throughout the past couple months going through this book. Like just uh, what the Lord revealed to us as we were studying. Um... But yeah, that that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions, if I said anything wrong, please let me know. Um, Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so another friend sharpens another. And that could mean correction. So if I'm wrong in any area, if I said something that you don't understand, or if I said something that's flat out heresy, please tell me. It's always hard to talk about the Holy Spirit um, because it, it's... It's not a new thing, but it's new talking about him, um, not as it. Does that make sense? Um, but glory goes to God. I hope um, this is something we could remember. And I'm talking about myself as well, that this would dwell in our hearts and in our minds. And that um, when we have that urge to let the flesh come out, that uh, God's word would be in our hearts and in our minds and we have more self-control. Uh, it says that we, we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear. Um, the Lord will provide a way out. So just remember that next time you get upset, whether it be with the kids, with your husband, with, even with false teachers, Lord needs to help me in that area too. Because like I said earlier, opening, uh, it's real easy for us to fall into sin because we are sinful creatures. It's, that's natural to us to sin. Um, so even when we're right, we make ourselves wrong. This is why proverbs is important so this friday um we got prayer and testimony night i was supposed to be sharing but there's no way i could do two studies in one week uh so i'll do next friday uh, but this friday is going to be prayer and testimony night um we always post a number and stuff to the line it's on friday nights at 10 o'clock uh new york time i never get mad at you <laughs> um and then uh this tuesday is going to be Chanel and Candy. I don't know if they're ready this Tuesday, but Chanel and Candy is going to be, um, they're doing a double live. I'm a little bit jealous about it. They're doing uh, wives and husbands, so they're going to do uh, the next thing. And then um, after that, I think we got um, Dorothy's after that, and then we got the Armor of God, which is exciting. We'll see what happens there. Um, yeah, and then next friday not this friday coming up but next friday i'll be um sharing on the line about the road to Emmaus. so keep me in prayer for that um if anybody needs any prayer or anything dm us um if you have a question if you don't understand send us a dm there's no question too hard or too easy um and if we don't know the answer we'll look for it together uh, through god's word because we don't know everything we're not that smart believe me we're not um we're still learning the same way but we're meant to learn together so if there's something that um you're unsure about or you just need prayer with or whatever feel free to dm us let us know and um i guess that's it i'm gonna pray us out and uh go fix my eye because my eye's been going crazy all night <laughs> uh, is there any 
thing we need to pray for. Any prayer requests before uh, when I close? Any things we need to keep in prayer? Anything anybody could think of? No, if not, I'll just um, I'll just close. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, um, for this message that you gave us tonight, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you um, made it possible for women like us, uh, housewives who are uneducated and don't know these big words, Lord. You made it easy and you opened our eyes and our hearts and gave us understanding, Father. That's a gift from you for us to know, to hear these things and to understand them and to comprehend them. And not only that, um, but let, that you would let them dwell in our hearts, Lord. And um, we thank you, Father. Uh, we are so unworthy to be sharing your word. I am, I am the most unworthy person to be talking to other women about, um, about you, Lord, and how to live. But um, I thank you, Father, that by the grace of God, you saved us and you set us free. Um, and you remember our sins no more, Lord. And we're not held captive um, to sin anymore but we're set free from it and we're no longer in bondage to sin. We're no longer slaves to, of sin, but we're slaves to Christ. And we thank you for that, Lord. We give you glory and honor and praise for all that you've done. I pray that this word um, would stay in my heart as well as the other girl's heart, Lord, that we would um, dwell on it, Lord, and, and uh, chew on it, Father, and that we would apply it ultimately to our lives, um, that we may live spirit-filled lives um, according to... Um, your will and your purpose, Lord. Uh, we're praying for um, these next couple studies that are coming up, Father, and um, pretty soon we have to come up with new lists. We ask that you would uh, direct us and lead us and guide us in those areas um, all according to your will, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before you end, pray for my cousin Jennifer's son. Uh, I did earlier about pray for her again tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to pray. Um, Lord, we come before you, Father, and we bring before you uh, Jennifer's son, Zach, Lord. We know that you are able to do all things, Lord. We know that you appoint uh, these doctors and these physicians in these areas, Lord. We know that you appoint these people um, in, these, in these areas of life, Lord. And you give them the knowledge, you give them the tools, you give them the technology um, on how to, how to get these done, Lord, ultimately to bring about your glory, Lord. Um, Father, we're praying right now, Lord, as baby Zach goes for his surgery tomorrow morning, Father, that you would give comfort to the family, Lord, give peace, let the surgery be uh, quick and successful, in Jesus' name, Lord, we're asking that you would, um, that, that it would be a, a, a quick healing process, Lord, that there would be no complications, um, ultimately, that they would see good results with this, Lord, and that there would be no fear, but that they would sing songs of of joy, sing the song of joy of their salvation, Lord, that they would uh, sing to one another hymns to build each other up, Lord, as we read about in your word, um, that they would look to your word, Father, that you would um, send someone there to encourage them with the, with the word, Lord, um, somebody there who, who they can talk to, Father, that they, um, while they wait in that waiting room, Lord, that there wouldn't uh, be any anxiousness or fear, um, we're praying, Lord, that you would protect them from COVID or any kind of cold, Lord, as we know this is such a sensitive thing um, to this baby's body, Lord, going through this big surgery. And then um, we pray that you would keep him safe, Lord, from any kind of sickness, um, as well as the family as well, Lord. Keep everybody safe. Praying for all the people in Texas with coronavirus, Lord, that you would heal them and their families completely. Um, protection on anybody who doesn't have it, that they wouldn't get sick. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to end it. Go find my glasses. Come when I'm. It's really bad. <laughs> All right, well, good night. God bless. I'll see you guys uh, next week.